Good afternoon. Thank you, Federico, for this invitation to participate in this extraordinary monetary and banking seminar. It's a pleasure to be here with you, the Central Bank of Argentina, of course. Thank you so much once again. I have a problem, which is the following. Two or three weeks ago, I talked to Federico, and he invited me to talk about the disinflation process in Chile, because we may share ideas with you, and it may be useful for Argentina. However, Jose de Gregorio, my predecessor, talked about this issue, and it was a wonderful presentation. Therefore, part of my presentation has already been in Delta by him, but I'm going to touch on some specific topics, uh, which, of course, due to time restraints, he was unable to deal with that. Three bullet points. First, institutional and historical aspects relating to the low inflation process in Chile, especially autonomy by the central bank, how it was born and its influence. Two, rate of exchange policy. Uh, type of policy we do have uh, in place today relating to some specific topics under study and discussion yesterday, which has to do with the rate of exchange mismatches and three changes and challenges in Chile today. As I only have 20 minutes, I'm speaking at full speed. Chile has a long history connected with inflation, a long history of inflation, maybe one of the longest in Latin America. And you know that Latin America has long histories of inflation. We have always had inflation pro problems by the turn of the 20th century up until the last century. Uh, in the 1940s, it was 20% average inflation, where inflation rates were low in the 1950s, 40%, in the 60s, 25%. It was reduced vis-a-vis -vis the other one. And in the 1970s, it peaked with 175% on average annually all over the decade, with a picking point in 1973, where inflation exceeded 500%. And we have never had a hyperinflation, strictly speaking, but we did have a different inflation rates that were very high indeed, which was the origin and source of for this inflation. As it happens everywhere, funding, monetary funding of fiscal deficits in 1973, highest inflation rate, 25% of GDP funded, largely funded by, of course, money printing. This history is well known by you all. There was a change in 1973, military coup, institutions changed, there were many reforms in the economy, and I would like to underscore the following viewpoint, an open economy plus an act passed in Congress concerning fiscal revenue and government administration in which public finance was rearranged. Each division spent money and just informed the central bank, or the, the national government, plus fiscal reform, arranging and ordering taxes, value-added tax included. In 1981, there was a surplus deficit in Brazil, and then we had deficit because of the debt crisis. All this justifies uh, our deficit, 25% in 1973, and then we go to a fiscal surplus three years later. So we pass from deficit to surplus in only three years. This rearranged the whole fiscal issue, and there were, in 1980, and then after the year 2000, new rules uh, whereby public finance was rearranged. And we always have had uh, fiscal surplus periods. Um, our rate is virtually zero. So, of course, we were able to curb uh, that trend, and we found a solution there, too. In 1980, a new constitution was uh, passed in uh, our country, which is very controversial indeed, but it provided for 
the independence of the Central Bank of Chile with a clear-cut mandate to preserve the value of currency and the normal functioning of internal and external payments, uh, uh, providing that uh, the Central Bank should fund uh, uh, the national government. We cannot have government bonds in our vaults. Well, uh, this is a little bit co complex and it is uh, food for thought later on. And what happened between that time and 1980? That is to say, 1980 and 1989. Well, finally, there was an act of Congress finally enacted, and the first governor of the Central Bank of Chile has published a very interesting book. Uh, there was a, an overall debt crisis at the beginning of the 1980s. It was very difficult to implement new reforms, and the second reason was based on a dictatorship issue because, of course, uh, we had a dictatorship and it was impossible to have an independent central bank, of course, because no dictator would like to have a central bank which is independent and making decisions different from the national Now, then, in 1989, Pinochet loses the uh, referendum and uh, the general elections were convened and uh, we knew who was going to win the elections, the opposition party to Pinochet, uh, led by uh, candidate El Aylwin, who was the first president after uh, our return to democracy. So we held negotiations between the military government, uh, outgoing, and the new democratic uh, government, an ingoing government. Oh, of course, those negotiations were not easy. I won't explain why here. There was a lot of distrust concerning national government authorities and the Central Bank, because remember that the law, the Act of Congress, which was proposed to be tabled and then approved, was, of course, originally in times of the our Chilean dictatorship. And then, of course, uh, then we uh, started walking along the path of independence. Uh, and this has to do with the fact that uh, the new governor of the Central Bank was much closer to the democratic government, which had been elected after the general elections, concerning the positive mission uh, that was carried out in the field of financial and fiscal reforms in Chile. So the Central Bank of Chile was created as an independent autonomy by the end of 1989 with a return to democracy. And this act of Congress, this law, was inspired in different laws concerning Central Bank, Bundesbank, and the Federal Reserve System of the USA. This was key to the later developments. Up until 1970, inflation rates were very high. And after the mid-1970s, it declined. 20% was the average inflation in 1980 and 1980s, the whole decade. Somehow, this gave much more weight to the fight against inflation. The central bank was legitimized in a very slow process in the course of time. Today, it's absolutely legitimized. It took time at the very beginning. The first lesson is the following. Institutions do matter. And in China, the fact that the central bank is independent and autonomous is of the essence and was of the essence to the development of this process. Second bullet point. The new board of governors uh, uh, within the Central Bank of Chile in the 1990s decided to implement a monetary policy based on the idea of being contractive. And of course, uh, Chile underwent a period known as the golden period for growth, 86, 97, 12 years. Economy grew by more than uh, 7%, 7 percent, 7.2. And in 1989, one year before the return to democracy, economy had decreased by 10 percent. However, the central bank, uh, in a time when inflation was growing, decided to implement uh, an extraordinarily contractive monetary policy which caused a deacceleration in growth from 10% to uh, 3%. 
three uh, percent is a bad figure, but think about that we were speaking about 10, seven percent, and all of a sudden we had three percent. Another element which uh, helped us gain credibility was the central bank decision, the new autonomous central bank decision to implement a contractive monetary policy, which was necessary to reduce pressures on inflation and favor a downside trend from then onwards. And many elements played a role herein, such as a strong capital inflow at the time, because capital was attracted, uh, which was increased for a very short time. And even though it then declined, we returned to democracy. And of course, our economy was active. And we had a rate of exchange appreciation period, very significant indeed in the 1990s taking into account that inflationary uh, pressures were contained. So high growth for many years in Chile up until the Asian crisis and major growth all over this period. So fiscal policy was in order, an orderly arrange, of course. Every year there was a period of fiscal surpluses. So in the 1990s, the Central Bank of Argentina, uh, sorry, the Central Bank of Chile, implemented this sort of monetary shock or currency shock and went to the Senate. You know that our national government has to go to, Sen to the Senate every September every year because, of course, they have to, of course, file their report. And this report is known as the inflation report in Chile. So the Board of Governance of the Central Bank, I was not a member at the time. I'm just interpreting the decision. They went to the Senate. They said we have to reduce inflation. How can we do that practically? Let's just fix a lower target. Uh, uh, remember, in the 90s, uh, uh, was 25, and the new target was 10, 15 percent. And this was done in Chile when nobody spoke about inflation targeting all over the world. In 1989, no one spoke about that. No one discussed about inflation targeting. And we did implement it, this sort of inflation target within the range of 10 to 15%. Maybe there were many other things that were not really consistent with everything that was happening in Chile in the 1990s. And we had a floating rate of exchange, and well, we have currency bans in place. So again, inflation target between 15 and 20%. And then, all in all, it was 18 percent, then 13, 16, 12, 7, uh, and it was 12, and then one digit inflation around 8 percent. Uh, this is correct because Federico yesterday, uh, while we were having dinner, he mentioned that in the first four years we are able to reduce inflation or relatively uh, quickly uh, up until we can reach a one digit inflation. But the process in Chile was much uh, slower. I mean, uh, we had to wait for four or five years up until we had the new inflation target in the year 2000. One question. Could we have acted uh, more quickly? That is to say, reducing uh, from 25 to 3 percent in one decade? It's difficult to answer this question. I don't know the answer. Furthermore, if I had to go back in time, I would do exactly the same because everything was successful indeed. Lower inflation, economy growing, uh, fiscal surpluses. But of course, we could have acted uh, more quickly, but we were absolutely terrified at indexation and stationary in Asia, high sacrifice ratio. So maybe we um, had a sort of exaggerated position, but this is what we did. This was a virtuous circle in the Chilean economy. And a complex period by the end of the uh, year 2000, uh, the 2004, 2008 Asian crisis, uh, well, there was recession in Chile, 1% uh, drop in GDP, the inflation issue 
had already been dealt with and resolved. The inflation had been reduced 3%. And 3% was our inflation target and has been our inflation target ever since those years, which translated into an additional drop, even in inflation, 2.3%. In the year 2000, we adopted the current inflation targeting scheme with a rate of exchange, a floating rate of exchange. So ever since the year 2000, up until now, our inflation rate has been 3% with a tolerance or a range between 1 and 2. 3.3% has been the average inflation rate, very near inflation target. But with volatility, we are a small economy, open, subject to external shocks. And we had inflationary periods that were over the inflation target and sometimes under the inflation target. I mean, significant periods in time in both directions. Uh, fortunately, when we were in Jackson Hole Conference and we mentioned countries that were half in, half out, that is to say, half up, half down, as Elon mentioned, we were there within the inflation target, even though some months before we had been over the inflation target. Now, this is what I wanted to share you concerning strong institutions, autonomy of the central bank, and the importance of the clear-cut commitment to price stability, which was uh, evident from the beginning, and it has been evidence all through this period. Bullet point number two, uh, do I have time? Okay. Well, well, I have time. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, this is a current issue, rate of exchange, flexibility, and currency mismatches. In Chile, we have a floating rate of exchange, and we have had this rate ever since the year 2000, up to now. It was precisely after the Asian crisis uh, that our economy, of course, was affected. We had currency bonds in place. We defended uh, the rate of exchange with high rates, having a direct impact on the economy. Optimal rate of exchange was a flexible one. And the rate of exchange system depends on each country and specific circumstances in each country. In Chile, we have floating rate of exchanges. And of course, in this sense, we reserve the right to intervene, but we have not intervened all over the last five years in the exchange market. There are some other countries with different circumstances. They intervene much more than Chile. Their economies are much more dollarized than our Chilean economy. And the great advantage of currency flexibility is the fact that it may absorb shocks and relative adjustment of prices, especially in small open economies like Chile and other Latin American economies. One of the costs is the rate of exchange volatility, as I mentioned before, productivity shocks, and on many occasions, from the economic uh, standpoint, our currency mismatches. So we have to take into account the following in this regard. According to the Chilean Ethereum, currency mismatches are endogenous, endogenous to the uh, exchange rate policy. We do have information which is uh, relatively uh, abundant and long on the corporate sector. Detailed information on corporations, I mean uh, publicly listed corporations, and we have seen that after flexibility, after currency flexibility, all those rates uh, dropped substantially because companies did not want to run exchange of rate rate risks, risks that were inherent to their business. And this is extremely important because we are aware about this fact. When we speak about floating rate of exchange, how flexible they may be, we review data. And there are experiences enabling us to assume that this is a minor issue. It's an issue that is not as important as it used to be 30, 40 years ago in the times of the 1980s crisis. Uh, well, 
well, economy is highly dollarized, and of course, problems with the peso dollar rate of exchange. Then we have the year 2008 experience, as Gregorio mentioned, currency appreciation and the corporate sector, which is very strong in the region and in our country, Chile, as well could, uh, of course, lead to the recession in the year 2009 and between the year 2013 and uh, 15, there was a depreciation, which was significant, but there were no problems with the corporate sector. Because in the Central Bank of Chile, we have conducted different studies concerning published data, and also we conducted research into the way in which we can manage all these circumstances. So we were relatively reassured of the fact that this was not a problem for us in Chile. We, in the 1960s, we created this inflation index unit which has advantages and drawbacks. One of the advantages was the fact that our economy was dollarized. And let me make some uh, comments on the recent scenario. We have many challenges in the Bank of Chile today, financial challenges, regulatory challenges, and of course the challenge of adopting the new international regulation. Latin America did not suffer from a financial global crisis as it happened. Of course it had adverse effects in the country, but we did not suffer the crisis directly as it happened in many other countries worldwide. We had to adapt ourselves to the new circumstances, accommodate ourselves through the new scenario so as not to be excluded from international business. and. It is clear that one of the major challenges was uh, adopting international regulation and the uh, challenges concerning uh, the overall uh, uh, challenge connected with the uh, powers. And this panel session, hinging on the following fact, has to do with over the last years, emerging economics has suffered from two major shocks. One has to do with the paper term 2013. In that year, we were initiating a new process to reduce monetary stimulus purchases by the Federal Reserve System, reducing capital flows in emerging economies. We have to be clear here, reducing, reducing, but they were significant for a long period. And number two, a strong drop in commodities prices after 2011 and also after 2013. Copper in Chile today is half its value compared against what happened five years ago when I uh, took office in the year 2011. This led to a slow growth of the economy. In the past three years, it's been 2% growth. And the Chilean economy after the golden period is uh, used to 4 to 5% growth. The past three years have been the lowest grow, 2%, which has caused a series of concerns regarding potential growth and long-term growth of the economy. Together with that, the strong indexing of the exchange rate resulted in increased inflation. What was the response of the central bank to this shock? To reduce interest rates. Why reduce interest rates? Because we are talking about a temporary shock in an economy that was decelerating, where inflation effects were basically a one-time effect. For two years, the economy was above the upper part of the tolerance range. Only in the past two or three months have they returned to that range of tolerance. The idea, I insist, is that monetary policy was the reasonable one in a scenario of lower growth where the capacity gap was beginning to open. What is the key here? Basically, the key are expectations, inflation expectations. In other words, what we do is look ahead. In our case, the horizon of projections is two years. And during this period, inflation expectations have remained anchored in the two-year horizon at 3%, which is the target. They have never moved from there. And this has enabled us to have this highly expansive monetary policy. A, an episode by late 2015, when the thing seemed not to be anchored anymore, there were two marginal monetary policy adjustments. Now, the exchange rate after three years 
we have appreciated what happened in most emerging economies. That is something that will imply an inflation that will go down faster than we would have expected. But in the same way as when inflation grew up because of the exchange rate, we maintained an expansionary policy. We are not going to react in the opposite direction when inflation is under our target with an appreciating exchange rate. In the meantime, inflation target targets will remain on target. If there are second round effects, we will have to act. So the vision is basically that, looking at the future. We are talking about inflation targets with a future perspective. The key is how much inflation will be in two years. That beyond the volatilities of inflation in small open economies like ours.